Welcome, friends, to the How To Heretic. I'm Uncle Mark. And I'm Uncle Dan. And I'm Uncle Doug. And this is your user's guide to life on the outside. That's right. Leaving religion is the first step into a larger, better world. But it can also be a scary world. (laughs) Things work differently now. Never fear. That's why we're here. We're your audio uncles. And with help from good friends and experts in all sorts of fields, we're going to share the stories and seek the knowledge to build a great life. After all, you only get the one that we know of, so you better make the most of it. (laughs) Well, guys. Well, hello. Here we are at episode one five two seven six four three niner. <laughs> Roger that. November Charlie Foxtrot Niner. This Niner, I love it. Um, <laughs> one fifty two without all that other shit. And yeah. uh, what a fun show, uh, Doug. You uh, have a date. I am going to talk about a surprisingly badass goddess uh, who I didn't, I, I'm just surprised I didn't know more about. Well, now we will. Yeah. Mm. yeah. B. And Arthur, have- here we come. <laughs> <laughs> and what about you, Dan? Uh, I'm, I am going to try and, uh, and make sense of this world for oh. all of us. Why bother? I know. And- and then I, uh, we have a very special interview with our dear friend Chrissy Stroop and our new friend Lauren O'Neill to talk about their excellent new uh, compilation of essays, newish, uh, empty the pews. Please stick around for that; it's really cool. And uh, that's kind of it. The only other thing I'd say is uh, I, I still kind of get emails from people who are like, "Hey, w- uh, what show was that such and such a segment in?" Remember that you can search the website. You can go to the, our website, howtoheretic.com. There's a search function, and uh, you can enter a keyword. You should be able to find whatever segment you want without bothering me on well, a Tuesday and, night. And the truth is that you're going to do a much better job of searching that than Uncle Mark is. He is yeah. bad at the internet. I can't spell Utnapishtim to save my life. So <laughs> so go, use that. Also, we're I think about a third of our segments are up on our YouTube channel, broken out individually by Sweet Vern. So <laughs> what a task he's got in front of him. But you can find a bunch there. And uh, with that, let's do a show. <laughs> Ankle Dan. Hey. You know, did you just call me Ankle Dan? I, Ankle Dan. <laughs> I just called you Ankle Dan. I haven't called you that in a long time. We no, thought that no, was behind you, us, didn't we? You were focused on my wrists for a long time. Now. I have been <laughs> mostly focused on your wrist, but you have the, the, the most incredibly slender ankles I've ever seen on a man person. It's like I a call Barbie them doll. Elegant. Yeah. I they, like to go with elegant. They're very elegant. <laughs> I, I call them dankles. <laughs> um, so, Ankle Dan, now that we've yes. established our, our, our joint fetishes, yeah, uh, you know, there's a here at the How to Heretic, there's a fifty percent off drinks special. Ooh, yeah, for wow. for a ladies' night. I'm excited. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and uh, uh, you know, we are three men. There are not a lot of ladies on this show. No. So no. Listeners sometimes remind us. So Doug, today, Doug, I think, is going to uh, serve up that drink special to a, a very special guest. Hey, listen, every night is ladies' night at my place. And is every it? every week is infrastructure week. So, <laughs> well, dear uncles, these are indeed dark times, so we must revel in the good news when we can find it. And last week, there was some. Mm. This last week, the first Amer- African-American slash Indian-American woman was selected to be part of a major party ticket. So Yay. it will be cold comfort when the election is inevitably stolen, but it's something. So <laughs> yeah. rock on Kamala. <clears throat> um, Kamala. 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 Yeah. Kamala. Thank you. Thank you. Cody fixed that so no one, no one ats me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this news had me wanting to bask in some female energy. So to prepare for this segment, I put on some Helen Reddy and got to work. Uh, at first, I thought I would celebrate with you. For, by quoting- for anyone under 60, Helen Reddy was a recording artist from uh, Australia, <laughs> I believe. Yeah. Um, at first, I thought I would celebrate with you by quoting Cardi B and Megan Thee Stallion's new single, WAP, at length. <laughs> and, and, and if you don't know what that stands for, don't look it up. Um, how- no, do look it up. Awesome. I know exactly. I like what it stands for. Yeah. Um, however, I was informed by Andrew Torres that this would be such an egregious act of cultural appropriation. <laughs> That it would effectively nullify the Emancipation Proclamation and the 13th Amendment. So, <laughs> so I will not do that. And if you're wondering why Ben Shapiro doing exactly that had no lasting effects, oh. well, 
it turns out that you must be this tall to nullify the Constitution. (laughs) (laughs) I loved how horrified he was by that. That oh was, my God. is there Horrified. anything more singularly pathetic than a white man quoting rap lyrics disapprovingly? Yes. Oh, it was delightful, actually. I really enjoyed it thoroughly. And, and <laughs> refusing, refusing to engage in, in uh, you know, female liberated sexuality by refusing to say pussy. I know. Right. Yeah. What a, what it's a, a P word. I th- West, wet ass p word. Wet ass p whores word. in this house. There are <laughs> whores in this house. There are whores in this house. I don't. Uh, I don't quite understand him, but I'm not going to try. So, yeah. <clears throat> instead of quoting Cardi B, I thought we could reach back into the tomb of the de- of dead gods and goddesses and talk about a badass goddess, Ishtar. Oh yeah. Whew. And before you ask, no, we're not going to talk about the 1987 buddy comedy Ishtar starring Dustin Hoffman and Warren Beatty. Oh, bummer. It's the best movie I don't think I saw. <laughs> By the way, if you, have, if you have seen that movie and you liked it, I highly recommend it letting it exist in your memory only. <laughs> yeah. Hoffman and Beatty's ham-fisted scene chewing is the least problematic thing about it. Yeah, apparently it's legendarily terrible, right? It's, it's like, yeah, it's, a, it's like one of, the, one of the great bad movies of all time. Yeah, one yeah. of the biggest flops of all time. And just, just stuffed full of problematic cultural references. But, ah, yeah. perfect. Yep. So uh, Ishtar, originally called Inanna, was the Sumerian goddess of love, beauty, sex, war, justice, and political power, and was also known as the Queen of Heaven. So, so she was the Jared Kushner of her time. She just had all, <laughs> all the jobs. So Ishtar was a pretty heavy hitter. Uh, she dates back as far as 4000 BCE, but was a fairly regional minor deity until the conquest of Sumer by Sargon of Akkad in 2300 BCE. And before you ask, no, we're not going to talk about the anti-feminist gamer gator Carl Benjamin, who calls himself Sargon of Akkad. Um, I would yeah, say that good. he's worth our, his own segment if we ever are in a really sour mood someday, but I don't think he deserves any more oxygen. Yeah, fuck that guy. What's ironic about that is that the actual Sargon of Akkad was a major devotee of Ishtar. Mm. And as we'll see, there may be no goddess in history less applicable to an anti-feminist rape apologist like Benjamin. Hmm. But I guess that's his problem. Uh, That's one of them. Yeah. The actual Sargon of Akkad conquered Mesopotamia and may be the first person to rule over what we would call an empire. Uh, As the various city-states of what would be called the Akkadian Empire began sharing gods and goods, they combined Inanna with a similar goddess, Ishtar. So going forward, we'll actually refer to her as Inanna Ishtar, which is Mm. kind of how she's referred to in scholarly circles, which I am not a part of. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> Under her new name, she became one of the most widely worshipped deities in the Sumerian pantheon and became the highest deity in the Assyrian pantheon, even outranking Asher. She appears in more myths and legends than any other Sumerian deity, including prominently in the Epic of Gilgamesh, the Jewish Bible, and as we'll talk about, she influenced many other female goddesses to come. Hmm. Temples to Inanna Ishtar were constructed throughout the region. And her prominence, uh, as her prominence rose, she basically assimilated other minor female deities, including, among many others, Kilili and Shihir- Sahirtu, who were two other goddesses of love and sex. So it, it seems that her prominence as the goddess of sex and love and her assimilation of other sexual goddesses produced a goddess of somewhat sexual, o- open sexual fluidity. Well, you are what you eat, right? I mean, yeah, she's exactly. eating all the other goddesses. <laughs> Uh, and, and this sexual fluidi- fluidity led to the fact that uh, transgender people were heavily involved in her cult, often working as priests in her temples. Uh, f- for such a prominent and long-lived deity, she had myriad signs and symbols associated with, with her, most famously an eight-pointed star, the planet Venus, the rosette, which is kind of a decorative round flower icon, doves, and the lioness. Hmm. Stone figures of a wide-hipped woman clutching her breasts were also common symbols, and women would use these molds to form to make cakes for in, in that form as part of ritual worship. So that's I, interesting. I, wow, I, you know there there is a long history of uh, of dirty cakes that I did not know about. <laughs> yeah, not just for bachelorette parties. Yeah, and I like it. When when did cake baking become? You know, like it seems like modern cake baking is the exclusive province of like right wing Christians. <laughs> <laughs> How the fuck did that I, happen? Yeah. I don't know I, what makes you go into the floral arts or baking if you're just a complete scathing bigot, but there you I go. Know. So, uh, Inanna Ishtar was young, impetuous, and ambitious. 
And although she was the goddess of sex and love, she was not the goddess of marriage or motherhood. Mm, nice. <laughs> Differing accounts have her married, but she was absolutely not faithful to her husband, and it appears she had no children, although accounts differ. Let's just say that Inanna Ishtar would have made Mike Pence very uncomfortable. <laughs> although she That's probably... a very low bar, Doug. <laughs> exactly. Scholars differ on whether her rituals included sexual acts, with some arguing that they did, and they even included homosexual acts. Although she probably nice. had no children, she had many brothers and sisters, including a twin named Utu, who was the god of the sun, and a sister named Erish Kigal, uh, who was the goddess of the underworld. So kind of a, you know, a family to watch, I suppose. <laughs> there are many familiar elements in the countless myths about her, including a tree in a garden with a serpent in it, as well as the appearance of Lilithu, the forerunner of Lilith, and therefore Eve, which we talked about back in episode 56. Yeah. There is another tree whose fruit contains carnal knowledge. In one myth, she tries to conquer the underworld and is killed, but brought back to life three days later. Uh, and in, a, yeah, in another, a shepherd and a farmer compete for her favor in a precursor to the story of Cain and Abel. Hmm. So everything old is new again. Hold up a minute. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and all of those myths are obviously recycled and recycled through uh, the region over and over again before they made their appearances in the Hebrew Bible. Right. In another myth, Ishtar sleeps under a poplar tree, and the gardener of that tree, uh, forgive me, Shuka Latuda, rapes her while she sleeps. Ishtar awakens to discover she has been violated. Apparently, he wasn't much to speak of. <laughs> and let's just say she's not okay with it. In her pursuit of her rapist, she unleashes plagues upon the earth, including turning rivers to blood and a series of destructive storms. She finally catches up to Shuka Latuda and forgives him. Just what? kidding. She, ah. she kills his ass. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, her prominence in ancient Mesopotamia is so widespread that although not specifically named in the Bible, she is re referenced in Jeremiah, the Song of Solomon, which you covered in episode 98, and Ezekiel, which Mark found his way through in episode 88. Barely. Yeah. Yeah. She was so a heavy what, what is the, how, how is she referenced? If, well, if not in, by name? in the Song of Solomon, the Song of Solomon is actually a almost like a copy of a traditional... Uh, Mesopotamian love prayer. A lot of right. the, the the poems that uh, Inanna Ishtar appears in are like epic poems, like Gilgamesh, for example, and there's a bunch of them. And the Song of Solomon is is a writ small version of a, of an epic poem. And the a lot of the allusions to the the woman in that poem are clearly allusions to Inanna Ishtar. Mm -hmm. And then uh, in Jeremiah and Ezekiel, it, it references her cult. Which is obviously an enemy to, to Yahweh, right? So not named, but definitely referenced. But another, another reference of, uh, of the countless references to polytheism in the Bible. Exactly, exactly. <clears throat> uh, she was a heavily influenced in the cult of the Phoenician goddess Astareth, the cults of the Greek goddesses Aphrodite and Athena, the Caucasian goddesses Aenina and Danina, the Georgian goddess Dali, the Hindu goddess Durga, and even later into the cult of the Virgin Mary. So hmm. she's, she has uh, she's covered a lot of ground. Yeah. Her cult someone began... someone that didn't have children, she has a lot of children. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and, and her influence in like the cult of, of, of the Virgin Mary is a bit unexpected. It's certainly not sexualized, but there are other aspects of, of Inanna uh, Ishtar that, that Mary took on as time went by. So hmm. uh, her... Let's see, her, her cult began to seriously decline between the 3rd and the 5th century CE as the region converted to Christianity, although elements of her cult persisted in pockets of Turkey as late as the 18th century. Her direct influence has nearly disappeared, with uh, her successors such as Athena and Aphrodite taking much of the spotlight. However, she has made some interesting appearances in modern popular culture, such as the aforementioned film Ishtar, <laughs> as well as in the 1963 slasher film Blood Feast, in which she is incorrectly identified as Egyptian. Uh, by the way, that film was such was so successful that there was a sequel, Blood Feast 2, All You Can Eat. Which oh, had, nice. Which had the original working title of Buffet of Blood in, <laughs> in 2002. So the original oh. was in 1963 and the sequel was in 2002. Wow. But uh, the character, yeah, the character of Buffy Summers in Buffy the Vampire Slayer is heavily influenced by Inanna Ishtar. Oh, interesting. For obvious reasons, she also figures prominently in BDSM culture, 
Wicca, hmm. as well as myriad death metal songs. Oh, nice. But her, yeah. Um, her most positive role in modern culture has been in feminist theory, in books such as The Second Sex, The Goddess Within, Descent of the Goddess, Inanna's Ascent, and many others. And it's easy to see why. Inanna Ishtar was a badass. <sighs> she did what she wanted, took what she wanted, fucked who she wanted, and when someone messed with her, she fucked him up. <laughs> so... Uh, since the anti-woman religious Christianity, you know, religions, Christianity and Islam have taken such a grip on the face of the earth, it's a bit hard to imagine a female deity with such a liberated identity and, and prominent position. But Inanna Ishtar was most definitely those things. So, hmm. nice. yeah, I'm, I'm a bit surprised she doesn't play a, a more prominent role. And, I, and I, you know, if I'm wrong about this, listeners, and there's, you know, the, the, I'm missing some some of her prominence in, you know, modern feminist or trans culture. I'd love to know that. Because she's like the OG badass. She's such a crazy yeah, cool person. I've, I've, I haven't heard her name come up in that context that I can remember, but it doesn't mean it's not there. I mean, it's not like a, the center of my bullseye of expertise. Right. But it seems like she would be, a you know, in the same way Lilith is a major uh, feminist icon, you know. Yeah. Because she's not, she's not just the god of sex and love, which she definitely is. Mm. But in most of her history, she was also the goddess of war. Right. So she was, she was a conquering warrior. Um, and I just, I didn't, you know, I had no idea she had such a, a, a robust resume, shall I say? Yeah, oh, yeah, she had a lot going on. Yeah, but that's typical. A woman has to do like three times the work to get paid the same as a man, right? The other gods, <laughs> totally. the male gods, right? Yeah, they probably made way more money. Right. And they and and people just believed them without them having yeah. to do anything. They're, they're, it was just they she, were always telling yeah. her to smile. Oh, <laughs> Bullshit. No wonder she fucking went berserk. Yeah. Right. So there you go. That's Anana Ishtar. Nice. I love it. Cool. Well, let's uh, let's uh, wave as we go by. Let's elect her to vice president this uh, this November. Yay! Right. <laughs> Uncle Mark. Yes. I was watching my favorite modern TV show again last night. Your 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 favorite modern TV show? My Doug? favorite my favorite up to date TV show. My favorite contemporary relevant sim- contemporary teleplay drama? Yes. What, tell me, what is that? Well, you know, the X Files. <laughs> <laughs> and and the motto of that show, of course, is I want to believe. Yeah. Yeah. Um yeah. and, and I, I want to believe that that show holds up over time. Um, well, you know, it's funny. Remember, it, it had such a distinct look, you know, and it was always that kind of moist, hazy, uh, <laughs> you know, and I was like, oh, it's such a cool look. I wonder why it's like that. And then I did a movie in Vancouver and I'm like, oh, fuck, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. It's always gray. Uh, I just love that you called a show moist. <laughs> well, and that's actually the, the motto of Vancouver is moist and hazy. Moist, yeah. moist and hazy and uh, heroin. No, I love Vancouver. It's awesome. <laughs> Well, anyway, I think Uncle Dan wants to talk to us about that, about belief. Yeah. Well, I, look, we talk a lot on the show about how stupid most religions are. We go into detail about logical inconsistencies. They're not and, all stupid, Dan. Some are dumb. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Fair. Fair. Yeah. Uh, Sorry. Point of order. Dis- distinction without a difference. I yeah. like it. Sure. Uh, so we talk about logical inconsistencies, we talk about fallacious thinking, um, disconnections from reality. These are all the har- hallmarks of pretty much all the religious traditions. Mm-hmm. Week after week, we provide good reasons why people should run screaming from religion. Mm. It's a kind of our thing. The problem is that we don't offer much in the way of what to run to. We just say, look at how stupid all the stuff we were raised to believe is. That's a terrible foundation for a personal ethos. You agree? Great. Well, good luck. Enjoy your existential crisis. And we whistle our way down the path to next week's show. Because just negating the stupidity of religion isn't the same as helping someone to build a new system of codes and moral dictates to replace the old bad ones. I don't know about your stories, but when I left religion, I didn't have anyone to guide me anymore. I took some philosophy classes in college, which helped me learn about logic and reason and taught me how to see fallacious thinking to some degree. 
But as I stepped out into the religious framework of my youth, I had no help in uh, in figuring out what to step into. Yeah, same. The truth is, I didn't really understand that that was a thing I needed to do. I spent years just kind of floating around. I knew a bunch of things I didn't believe anymore, but it's not like I started down the path of of a Purp- as pr- of purposefully and consciously examining what I did or should believe. Even if I had wanted to, I wouldn't have known how to do that. I had no role models or people around me who had been there who could guide me. Mm. So, uncles, oui. I think it's time to ante up and put some thought into this. No. <laughs> oh, okay, show's over. Yeah, it's a short segment. Yeah. Uh, No, look, we're encouraging people to abandon the institution that was the ostensible basis for their whole moral outlook, the foundation of their worldview. Uh, The least we can do is provide a small primer on how to BYOB, build your own belief system. Hmm. Uh, And I do mean build your own. What I don't want to do is be like all of the religions out there and tell people what they should believe. And that may be a good first lesson. Ditch the concept of prepackaged belief systems. Yeah. Only, only you get to decide what your beliefs are. Sure, you should listen to smart people about what they believe and thoughtfully consider whether you want to adopt some or all of what you're hearing. We can recommend some other podcasts for that if you like. <laughs> Absolutely. <Yeah. laughs> sure. Great. I, I, I like Joel Osteen as much as the next guy. <laughs> but you have a veto for all of it. And it's a line item veto at that. You can totally pick and choose which parts of various beliefs you want to buy into. Don't ever let anybody tell you that if you believe X and Y, you have to believe Z. Mm -hmm. you're, You're done letting others dictate what is and isn't important. That's over now. That said, you don't have to do it on your own. You can seek out wisdom. Read books. Watch YouTube videos. Go to lectures or debates or whatever. Just listen for what sounds right to you and what sounds like bullshit. And then, and this is also important, ask why that is. Does it seem like bullshit because it's bad thinking? Or is it possible that it sounds like bullshit because it makes you feel something that you're not comfortable feeling? Mm. Those are very different things. So, with those in mind, I uh, I thought that we could demonstrate the process a little bit. By looking at some philosophies and concepts and ask ourselves just what we think of them, Mm. Um, whether they ring true to us or whether we bounce off of them and why. You guys game for that? Yeah, sure. Sure. Good, because otherwise (laughs) my whole segment is ruined. (laughs) Uh, Well, so I thought I'd start with some fun ones. I wanted to go back to our origin stories, Mormonism. Mm. Well, we can all quickly agree that the story of a group of enterprising ancient Jews who crossed the ocean and landed in America only to, sc- to discover that they, like the Zartan G.I. Joe of my youth, change color for no reason. Oh, I loved Zartan! <laughs> right? I that, don't remember Zartan. Did he change oh my color? God. Was he like photochromatic? Like he changed yeah, color? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If, oh. if you put him in the sun, he would turn blue. But, and then if you put him in water, he Well, if you like, put Uncle Doug in the sun for five minutes, he turns red like a lobster. So uh, that's believe true. me. Yeah, I did some yeah. yard work yesterday and I am, I am, I'm feeling it today. No, Zarmak, you could, he was temperature sensitive. Yeah. So you, you could like you know, squeeze him and then he'd have, like, he'd have almost like stripes on him. Well, I believe in him. <laughs> right? Yeah. Anyway, so put uh, that in the yes column. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but we can all agree that like that other Mormon stuff, the the story uh of Nephi and Lehi and everything is stupid and can be dismissed out of hand. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But as we've discussed many times, even though the book even though the Book of Mormon claims to be the foundational text of Mormonism, it is mystifyingly unrelated to the practices and beliefs of the religion. Show sure enough. Yeah. So, we're going to look at a few of the Da 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 da, Mormon articles of faith. Oh, oh! These are the thirteen. Big thirteen. Sta- <clears throat> yep, the, their statements of belief, carefully crafted by the founder and original prophet, seer, and wife hoarder of the Mormon Church, <laughs> to tell the world. <laughs> wife, I've never heard the term wife hoarder before. It's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> this is to tell the world what the Mormons are all about. So. Yeah. Uh, we can ignore a bunch of them because they're just about Jesus and his dad and their ghost friend 
uh, and some are about, you know, how magic and profity this church is. But some of them may be more applicable to us and might be worth our consideration. So we're going to we're going to look at a couple of them. Why not? Uh, we're just going to list. We're just going to examine two things. First, I think it'll be fun for us to examine, do Mormons actually believe what they say they do? They don't. Uh, and then the second, is there anything in there that could be of benefit to us? Mm. This is a this is a f- figuring out what is baby and what is bathwater uh, exercise. Mm. So, uh, I'm going to start with uh, with number eleven in the in the top thirteen things that Mormons believe, which is, quote, we claim the privilege of worshiping Almighty God according to the dictates of our own conscience, and allow all men the same privilege. Let them worship how, where, or what they may. Hmm. Now, the first question to me is, do Mormons really believe that? Because I've seen how they respond when you talk about Satan worshipers or whatever, and I don't think that they're cool with well, everybody I th- having I think the same they, privilege. Th- you scratched out the last line of that, which was, until we're in charge. Right. Yeah. Right. I, I, it, look, I I would be more apt to believe the live and let live sentiment of that from a group that didn't have, what, 60,000 teenagers out in the world bugging people to worship the way they do. <laughs> right. Right. So, I mean, I at best, they're 50% on that one. Well, right. believe me, they get in the way of my worship of my deity, whiskey. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but in yeah, if you live in Utah, see how much see how much they let you do that. Yeah, worship. the liquor stores are closed on Sunday. Their big mall is closed on Sunday. The, you know, like they're they're not really so much about you do you in my opinion. No. Right. So, yeah, uh, but we, I would say, to a large extent, are about you do you. But my question is, where do you guys fall on the idea of? Everybody should be allowed to worship whatever they want, wherever they want, however they want. Uh, I, I feel like this, this might be a trap, but um, <laughs> That's I'm, <me>. I'm, <laughs> I'm pretty firm on that. I mean, and, and, you know, worship, I guess, needs to kind of be fleshed out a little bit. And, right. and there need to be obvious parameters on when what I believe and, and how I worship infringes on someone else and what they believe and how they quote unquote worship. But – you know, I, you know, we if we're gonna demand that we have the right to be free from religion, we have to allow for people to be shackled by it. Yeah, right. I, I think <laughs> I think in the way that in a you know in a in <clears throat> any modern civilization that freedom is a regulated uh, commodity. Uh, I think sure, absolutely, you should absolutely you should be able to worship how and when and what you want. But it should be regulated as much as my freedom is, right? <clears throat> yeah, yeah. There need to there need to be some fucking guardrails for the things that inevitably happen in religion, which is abuse of children, abuse of women, you know, f- uh, intolerance spilling over, uh, you know, outside the pews into the rest of the, into into my world. So, <clears throat> as long as you know everybody's basically safe, and there there is those there are those kind of protections then i think yeah knock yourself out but there there is there are dragons though right like <clears throat> obviously this isn't as simple as it sounds what about people who don't believe that their children should be vaccinated or right or well that's get what i mean by the, by regulation right there right there are limits that you 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 don't own your children and at some point they're going to be adults and we don't want either children or adults dying of measles so yeah yeah, so I I think that that's a that's a great way of looking at this. Uh, I mean, uh, sort of a good example of why this process is important because you have to you know when you're first examining it, it might be obvious to say, yeah, let everybody worship as they want, but then you read a story about people who let their child die because they didn't believe in taking them to the doctor; they believed in prayer instead, and that's when we have to draw some lines. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, I think I think there's a nice sort of lear- lesson learned in that about it's nothing is black and white in the real world. Yeah, nothing is. You can't draw hard, hard, hard lines on almost anything. Right. So uh, let's move on to Article Thirteen. Mm-hmm. Uh, this one's the long one, so so buckle in. We believe in being honest, 
true, chaste, benevolent, virtuous, and in doing good to all men. Indeed, we may say that we follow the admonition of Paul. We believe all things, we hope all things, we have endured many things and hope to be able to endure all things. (laughs) If there is anything virtuous, lovely, or of good report, or praiseworthy, we seek after these things. Okay, Uh, what the fuck does that mean? I know. Yeah. It could we, be, a, we believe all things. We seek all things. It, yeah. We hope all things. <laughs> what well, what are I, you talking about? That list of virtues also included benevolent, which yeah. encompasses all those virtues. Right. Yeah, exactly. And also, uh, obviously, he could have gone on to 14 and 15, but because he was a lazy fuck, <laughs> like he, 13 is a catch-all. It's like everything yes. that isn't in the first 12 is in this one. Right, and we like all the things that are nice. <laughs> I mean, well, great, you know. And, but there, but there are some some uh, some little landmines in there. Yeah, uh, the word "chaste" comes up, which I think is interesting, uh, especially for a man who had thirty something wives. Yeah. I think he was. It referred to him chasing women. <laughs> yeah. Oh, he just oh, misspelled it. That's right. Yeah. It's just C H A S E D is how he meant to spell it. Yeah. Exactly. Um, yeah, I mean, I, here's the thing again, I want to, I, I read this and walk away from the black and white thinking. I look at words like honest and I'm like, yes, I very, I believe deeply in, on, in personal honesty, but there's lots of times when lying is a good choice. You know what I mean? Yeah, it can be. If, if somebody shows you their baby and says, don't you think she's beautiful? (laughs) I don't care what you actually think. And you, you as, say yes. You, as you're reaching for the vial of holy water in your pocket. <laughs> right. Yeah. If, if your friend shows you her new engagement ring and says, what do you think? You love it. The yeah. answer is you love it. Yeah. If your child draws a picture and wants you to put it on the fridge, but it's a piece of shit. Yeah. Right. It's probably best to lie about it. Oh, yeah. look. It's a, is that a cat's butt? Oh, <laughs> no, that's grandma. Great. Going on the fridge. Great. Yeah, yeah. she'll love that. Yeah. I'm, uh, she'll, I'll definitely tell her about it for sure. Well, um, I also, though, there, there's, you know, I, I, I don't want to just pick on Mormons, uh, you know, just to do that. But those are no, all. Go ahead. That's <laughs> fine. <laughs> there's standards in there, you know, all that honesty. It, uh, this show basically exists to chronicle the myriad dishonesties of the Mormon church. Yeah. <laughs> right? Like it, not, everything from lying about a hundred billion dollars to lying about a goddamn rock in a hat. Yeah, yeah. You know, the whole church is an enterprise in dishonesty. So I, yeah. I just, on that note, I just finished Joanna Brooks, um, Mormonism and white supremacy. Where, that uh, her book, I highly, highly, highly recommend to anybody who's interested in, <clears throat> in sub topic of Mormonism. But she has a whole, and she's a she's a Mormon, right. and she has a whole segment about the the habit that Mormons have called lying for the Lord, yeah. that is so ingrained they sometimes don't even know they're doing it exactly right. because of the defensive crouch they've convinced themselves they've been in their entire existence. You know, um, so yeah, I mean dishonesty is is, and it's not just Mormonism, but it is definitely endemic in the Mormon hierarchy and structure. And I, I right. think Dan, to your point, is that a virtuous thing to strive for? Yes. Absolutely, but I can't help but find it hypocritical, you know, the, in the, in this context that that's something the Mormons hold up as one of their banners of their faith. I, I right. hard like what after youth, after being like twelve or thirteen, I never heard discussion of the thirteen articles ever again. Yeah, that's an interesting one. I let me. I I don't have them all written here, but I'm going to pull them up just because when I was going through them. I was actually very surprised to see a couple of them that I hadn't thought about since childhood. Well, the second or third one is, you know, we don't believe that men are, men are published for punished, published, punished for Adam's transgressions <laughs> right? Uh, or the sins of the father. And then, of course, there was the November policy where they insisted that the children of gay couples mm-hmm. were to be punished for yeah. their parents' transgressions. Right. Exactly. Absolutely. So I don't think they live. I don't think they live by a single one of these. I like the idea. You know, I was looking at them, and I I got to Article 7, and they... How many Mormons do you think believe in the gift of tongues? (laughs) Older ones. I think much, much older ones do, because we talked about the Adamic language before, right? Right. Well, I think that's what they call French kissing at BYU. (laughs) (laughs) 
Well, it's uh, it's a theoretical thing. They've theorized yeah. that's a thing. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. So anyway, uh, there you go. I I think I think it's just helpful to sort of reframe what what you were raised with and and ask some real questions about it. Sure. Um, so I'm going to move on now, though, to because uh, look, we've done this exercise before on this show. We've we've looked at the Ten Commandments several times. Uh, and we, you know, going all the way back to episode 17 and in episode 67, Mark, you took us on a really lovely takedown of the seven deadly sins. Yeah. Um, and sins in general is an interesting concept. Uh, so, you know, it's worth asking yourself if you even believe in the concept of a sin. Sure. Which I actually vacillate on. Yeah. Um, but let's jump away from the Abrahamic religions and plop ourselves down in Asia. A lot of folks who leave dogmatic religions seek out Eastern thought as a possible replacement. So I thought we'd look at the three universal truths of Buddhism. Now, Buddha lived in the 6th century BCE, so his shit has been worked and twisted and interpreted a lot. Yeah. Uh, there are some big disagreements over what these are, what, what they mean, and even if there are three of them. Um, but for the sake of this... We'll just use three that I found on some website. Yes. <laughs> Don't at me. It's as uh, good as any other. Yeah. The beauty of this process is that uh, the authenticity or origin of the ideas don't matter. What matters is the ideas themselves and whether we find merit in it. So uh, I'm, I'll just read all three of these and we can just discuss them as a whole. One, everything in life is impermanent and always changing. Two. Because nothing is permanent, a life based on possessing things or persons doesn't make you happy. And three, there is no eternal, unchanging soul, and self is just a collection of changing characteristics or attributes. Well, I would say that is hits much closer to uh, the truth of the mark than any or all of the 13 Articles of Faith. Okay. Right? Um I think I definitely believe in impermanence and change. Yeah. That's that's certainly uh, a, a, something that has been real in my life. Yeah, and I, that, that's definitely true. Um, you know, the universe will eventually die and everything on it and in it. Um, well, and I, I don't know if, you know, it, it depends on who you ask whether owning people makes you happy <laughs> and, and whether you live above or below the Mason-Dixon line. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, and you know, my my over my overarching theory of a lot of Eastern religions is that these were philosophies cooked up to tell the masses of people who would never have anything, it's better not to have anything, right? Yeah. And so I think there's I think it's a very pretty poisonous stew that's dressed up as something very wise and beautiful. Um, yes, life is impermanent. Yes, just the pursuit of materialism at the expense of everything else in life is kind of an, can be an empty pursuit. But tell people who don't have any things that it's wrong to have things. Right. You know what I mean? Um, uh, it's th things are of an enormous benefit in this life. Yeah. <laughs> like there houses be... and food and, uh, you know, uh, uh, a computer and electric. Yeah. Like it's crazy. That's. I you try to tell some of my friends that a PlayStation doesn't make you happy. It yeah. can. Right. There's no reason why it, why it shouldn't. And you know now the thing is that I know a lot of people who I I have seen and met and talked to a lot of people who have supplanted a pursuit of of personal fulfillment with the pursuit of uh distraction. And yeah. I think maybe that's part of what this is getting at is the idea that, like, you know, if you buy the RV and the four wheelers and the boat and the this and the that, you can distract yourself and never have to actually look inward ever. You can just sort of keep yourself going fast and, you sure. know, get some adrenaline pumping that way. And you'll never have to, like, think about what brings meaning to your life. Well, yeah, I think that's you – know, I think the naked, you know, naked avarice or the collection of things is not – will never lead to fulfillment. And I think that's true. I think you know, we need to try and live for bigger things than that. But 
to your point, Uncle Mark, like you kind of need to have a house or uh, uh, you know, a <laughs> place to right? sleep. And- Look, a boat can be a lot of fucking fun, and and yeah. fun is fulfillment, right? Um, f- enjoyment of life, being out on the lake, or you know, taking your, you know, taking your RV on some adventure. That's fulfillment. Uh, I don't, you know, is the point the RV or what the RV can do for you, right? Um, right. And what it, the experiences it provides for you, and and yes, there are people, you know, look at who runs the country right now, for whom. Just the acquisition for the sake of acquisition is what fills the hole in the center of their empty being. Um, right. But, you know, I don't know. I think there is, I think there's joy in things. <laughs> so I've, I, uh, I, 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 I don't know. I've, I don't really have a lot of love for Buddhism. I think it's, I think it's a scam. And I think it, that in the West, it's been cycled into this kind of unquestionable wisdom and right. uh, I'm just kind of over that shit because um, you don't have to really dig very deep to see that there is a you know a tremendous amount of of uh, violence and bullshit in Buddhist countries, just like there is in in everywhere else. True that. Yeah. There you go. Interesting. Uh, all right. As a final contrast, I want to discuss a few of the seven tenets of the Satanic Temple. Oh yes. Uh, The nice thing about these is that, in religious terms, they're bleeding-edge recent. Yeah. Uh, They were developed by a group of non-theists and were written as a direct reaction against the stupidity of dogmatic religions like Christianity. Yeah. Uh, So let's just just talk about a couple of these. Um, So the first one is, one should strive to act with compassion and empathy toward all creatures— in accordance with reason. Love it. It's interesting, right? That yeah. in accordance with reason does seem like a bit of an out. Mm-hmm. It feels like a bit of a bail uh, when it comes to... Because I think they're trying to... I think they're... what Like half of what they're doing with all of these is leaving room for personal interpretation. Yeah. It's, so not, it's not absolutist. Right. <clears throat> well, that, so that's yeah. interesting. Like yeah, the Jane's, that point... The, the Jane's position would be absolutist. Right. Right. Yeah. But I mean, to that point, like, I kind of like the fact that there's an escape hatch on the back end. Right. Because, you you know, if, if you were to take what the first half of that is to its fullest extent, you, you'd end up being a Jane. You would have to gin- gingerly sweep the ground before you so as not to step on any insects, et cetera. Right. Like. Right. I kinda, it's a nuanced position, position to say that it's that it can be nuanced. Yeah. Right. That there can be gray. And, and and that the thinking people can disagree on it, right? And it's it it leans more towards ethics than it does towards dogma. Great. Let's yeah. move on to another one. Uh, here's this one I found interesting. This is their second tenet: the struggle for justice is an ongoing and necessary pursuit that should prevail over laws and institutions. Hmm. So in one in one tenet, they have sort of said that they that. That, that there's an overarching concept that is more important than laws and institutions. So they've kind of downgraded the law. And then they've, I don't know, the word justice hangs up for me. I Does have it? a I have a hang up with that because I, first of all, everyone defines it differently. You know what I mean? When, when you see all the, the pictures of, you know, justice for this person or justice for that person, and nobody knows what's actually being called for in those. Uh, I, I don't know what justice is. Do you guys have a strong well, sense I, of what you think I think what they're saying is, is that there are unjust laws. And, you know, we had, we had Jim Crow laws and we had right. blue laws and we had, you know, uh, just being gay was illegal. Those were right. unjust, right? And um, so the law is not always – the law – does not always equal justice, and clearly that's we're seeing that in you know in 2020 in America. So I think I, I quite I quite agree with their sentiment there that justice must never you must never think that it, it stops when it's something is made into a law that there's always somebody on the losing end of the struggle, and so the struggle must continue. And I'm I think that's great. Well, yeah. So. It, you're talking about uh, a sense of institutional justice or a sense of uh, of of sort of societal justice, which yeah. I actually really like. 
then the but they use the word justice and the struggle for justice and i think that that can be confusing when we start to get to an individual place where like you know someone has been wronged mm. and the you know there's a struggle for justice for them mm-hmm. you know specifically and what that looks like i think that that's that's where it gets a little murkier in my mind i guess hmm. but yeah i think take, yeah I, th- I think that it's an interesting I, – I think it's definitely – you're absolutely right that that what this is – the larger thing that this is referring to is, yeah, just justice in the sense of, of, of equity and equality. Yeah. Yeah, and um, fairness. But I think it's interesting that they didn't use those words. Yeah. Anyway, um, let's see. Uh, I like this one. This one's an interesting one. So this one's – because I wanted to get to some that are about sort of personal – uh, ethos or per, you know something that's not a grand thing but is personal so their number six is people are fallible if one makes a mistake one should do one's best to rectify it and to resolve any harm that might have been caused i think it's great all right yeah, yeah. i can get behind that yeah yeah i, th- I mean what the uh what the actual action is that causes that rec that rectification there there's some uh, some open ended things there and what and also there's the question of like what is meant by a mistake you know what i mean because there's a lot of things that are like that didn't work out great yeah but <clears throat> and and you know happened because of fallibility but may not need a uh, a restitution yeah it's a question of intention because there people do bad things fully intentionally sometimes rather right. than by accident but i you know maybe it's just a <clears throat> A poor turn of phrase, but I think it's a I think it's a very nice um, notion that yeah you're yeah. going to fuck up and it's to me that says you're going to fuck up and it's okay, right? Yeah, it's okay as long as you understand you did it and then you try to you try to set right what you what damage you did, which you might not might not be able to do, but it's 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 about uh, the person on the on it, it's about both people on each end of that situation, right? Yeah, they may not forgive it's, you. They may not let you off the hook, but you have done what you could to try to to fix it. It's also a fascinating contrast with the Christian th- thought of human fallibility, mm. which is that we are all broken, and somehow we owe something to God because of that, or somehow that's you know like God made us broken. We are we are uh, you know we are fallen. Yeah. Creatures, a lot of the time you hear that phrasing or whatever, but it doesn't ever, but the Christian concept of it doesn't turn to personal responsibility so much as it turns to stop being bad right. or you'll go to hell. The, the, the born sick and commanded to be well fantasy, yeah. right? And no, this, I like this because it is about interpersonal relationships and God doesn't enter into it. Right. Yeah. It's about it, it's about like watch yourself, figure out what you've done well or badly and then uh and then write yourself on the path. Yeah. And it's also kind of up to you to know when you've done that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh I really like their last tenet which is uh which is about the other tenets. Mm-hmm. Uh so that's kind of fun. Which is every tenet is a guiding principle designed to inspire nobility in action and thought. The spirit of compassion, wisdom, and justice should always prevail over the written or spoken word. Which to me says, look, if any of these end up making you do something stupid or mean or uh, unwise, ignore them and do the wise or compassionate thing instead. Yeah. Well, that's why it's, I mean, that's what's so great about it is this is not, these are not commandments. Right. Right. This is not dogmatic. This is like, here's a guide for living an ethical life. A simple, basic first step in living an it's, ethical life. It's our best, it's our best shot at it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I think that that's, I guess that's the point that I'm trying to make here is that uh, we all have to sort of take our best shot at, uh, at, at, establishing a a, a system of personal uh, ethics and morals mm-hmm. um so you know that this is all part of le- the journey of leaving religion is determining what's important to you what are your boundaries what are your morals uh and and you know what what ethics are going to dominate your personal code 
Yeah. Um, Because I don't think it's enough to just ditch bad thinking and foolish concepts. I think you got to figure out what do you believe. Yeah, you still, Not have in to, a, you still have to operate in the world after you've left whatever garbage you left behind. Yeah, and it's not just about, you know, sort of having – just having beliefs. But there's a and, – and I don't want it to think of it in terms of a sort of rigid, unchanging set of, of doctrines that you establish for yourself. But it's good to have – to know what you're about – in a way that like when you're in trouble or when, you know, when you're in a time of, of deep stress, you'll have something to grab onto. Yeah. Because uh, those re- in those really difficult moments, having something to hold on to can make all the difference. Yeah, you will be tested. So what, it, you know, when push comes to shove, what are you willing and not willing to do? And what kind of person are you willing and not willing to be? And then a lot of times we don't know it until we are tested. Yeah. 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 So go so, out there and get uh, tested, I guess. Get, get tested and uh, get a cream and get rid of it. Yeah. So that, I mean, that it, it's, it's just a, it's just sort of a, 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 a push toward, toward that. Yeah. And, uh, and, and I, I don't know, maybe we'll, maybe we'll come back with something more useful as we get feedback or whatever. Yeah. Tell us what you, tell us what you're willing and not willing to do and be, yeah. be explicit. Be graphic. <laughs> Re- Re- yeah, M- Uncle Mark reads all of the emails, so make sure that you are... Yeah, what I need just, is just, more nightmares, so just, just fill disgusting. up my head. Yeah. <laughs> all right, well, with that, let's uh, move on. Yeah. Gentlemen. What? Uh, listen, people, uh, listen to the show. We've talked about this before. We're not just doing this for us. Apparently, mm. it turns out. No. P- other people pay attention, they hear us, and then some of them like it so much, and this will never make sense, that they give us some of their money and we owe them some thank yous. Yeah, so, we have failed to hide our candle under a bushel uh, on the internet, and somehow people have, I don't know how that f- metaphor works, have they found our candle. I've always yes, wondered exactly. about, if you put a bushel on a candle, does it not catch on fire? It's a major fire. Yeah. All right. Yeah. yeah. Which then you think, well, that's shining more light than the candle originally did. Exactly. Yeah. And then you can find the needle like <laughs> really easily after the fire. There you go. Fire yeah. say, oh. fire solves every problem. Yeah. There you go. So do put your candle under, under a bushel, but not before you sign up to give us some of your money. Mm. And l- that's like these people. So thanks so much to Phoenix, Gerald, Allie, Denise... And uh, uh, Uncle Mark, I think yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna have you give a saint to our dear Melanie. Melanie, sorry, we still this website is vexing us. We're a little behind, so but 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 it will be worth the wait, I think, because the muse has spoken to me, and your saint. And this is going to be so obvious, you're not gonna believe. You'd be like, oh yes, I knew this was coming. <laughs> is uh yeah, is Saint uh, Simulatron. <laughs> uh, the plenipotentiary of uh, Mauritius, of course, and mm. uh, she is the patron saint. Of, Not to be confused with Saint Plenipotentiary of plenipotentiary uh, of of Long so Island, Tabacha. Yeah, never confuse those, or you'll cross the streams. <laughs> so she is the patron saint, of course, of uh, full contact croquet. Uh, the uh, Morris and Fran Gunderson family. <laughs> of uh, uh, 25 Decatur Street, Ann Arbor, Michigan, nice. and uh, and any and all capades, <laughs> iced or otherwise. <laughs> yeah, she's I, wonderful. I love that the country of Mauritius is not, it's not only the name of the country, but it's a description of its taste. I think that's so great. <laughs> it tastes so Mauritius. <laughs> Delicious Mauritius <laughs> is their tourist slogan. It's, it's yeah. very, it tastes mar- Hieronymus. <laughs> <laughs> So congratulations, well, Melanie. Yeah, wonderful, Melanie. Very yeah. good. And uh, and also we need let's power through and get Kyle, listener Kyle, his heaven. Okay, Kyle. <clears throat> if there's anything that 2020 has taught us is that things can always get worse, and if the trend set in motion in 2016 continues, 2021 will be worse than this year, and 2022 will be even worse than that. <laughs> so it comes as a relief when in the third year of the Melania Trump administration. You finally meet your end in a murder hornet monkey war COVID-24 collapsing bridge incident during an earthquake. (laughs) 
as this miserable now fades away, you wake up to a new and by default better reality. You are lying on your back in a field of soft grass, warmed by a bright but gentle sun. You sit up to take in your new surroundings, impossibly tall sequoias surround you, and and the cool breeze carries the sounds of exotic birds almost like a celestial chorus. As you get to your feet, you notice that you are on a hilltop, and that before you stretching out to the horizon is a series of immaculate gardens, each more beautiful than the last. A well-marked and smooth trail leads from where you're standing off into the distance. Your life of selflessness has been rewarded, and you realize that you get to spend eternity on one unending walkabout in nature. We know how you like those. What could be better? And you begin to follow this trail, and before long the sequoias give way to a flower garden of dazzling colors and textures. Fields of daffodils, tulips, and orchids stretch out like carpets of pure ecstasy. Flowers you have never seen before line your path of such complexity and delicacy that you are compelled to taste their fragrance. You reach down and pluck one, but before you can get it to your nose, you hear a voice. Excuse me, you're not supposed to pick those. You wheel around to see a middle-aged white woman with a bobbed haircut standing a few feet away. (laughs) You're not supposed to pick those, she repeats. I'm sorry you managed to sputter in stunned surprise. Yeah, there's signs posted everywhere, and if you do that again, I'm going to call the police. Okay, you say and lay the flower down where you found it. As you slowly walk away, she continues, We have rules for a reason. I don't know who you think you are, but... Her voice fades away as you round the turn in the trail. As you try to process what just happened, you enter an Asian garden, dotted with bamboo and Chinese maples of such precision that you forget your last encounter. In the center of the garden, there is a still pool with a cedar dock that reaches towards its center. You walk to the end and peer down at your reflection in the glassy surface. You slip off your chacos and sit down, letting your feet dangle in the cool water. Translucent koi dart to and fro at the disturbance. It's so beautiful that you... Excuse me, a voice interrupts. Standing just behind you is another white woman. Or is it the same one? You can't tell. You can't do that. There's signs posted everywhere. I'm sorry, you reply. I didn't see any signs. That's it, she says. I'm calling the police. She promptly pulls out her phone and dials. There's a man here who won't follow the rules, and you know what? He's threatening me. I don't feel safe. (laughs) What the fuck, you think? Almost immediately, another white woman shows up. The only thing that distinguishes her from the other is her uniform. You get to your feet and try to explain yourself to her when you notice the name on her badge, Officer Karen. Mm. (laughs) As you try to tell her you never saw any signs, she takes a step back and puts up her hand. Sir, stay back or I'll have to call for backup. Before you can even react, she is calling on her radio, and almost instantly, another white woman in a different uniform appears. Her badge reads, Captain Karen. This (laughs) continues to escalate until the dock is nearly full of Colonel Karen, Ranger Karen, Constable Karen, Commissioner Karen, etc., all telling you to calm down because they feel threatened. It finally hits you. The Almighty has prepared the perfect eternity of walkabouts for you, but she chose the only force in nature that could enforce the myriad rules that will keep it so immaculate, Karen's. So, Kyle, enjoy your perfect, never-ending nature walk. Just don't break any rules or act in a threatening manner. And for God's sakes, don't be black. <laughs> wow. That's a winner. There, there you go. go. Yeah, that's a winner, Kyle. Congratulations on that. <clears throat> super, super good. Uh, yeah. Well, if you, if you want to give us money, that's pretty easy to do. You just go to howtoheretic.com and, uh, and join the pantheon of the greatest folks of all time by clicking on the Support Us tab. And if you uh, can't afford to do that, that's fine too. But nothing is what it costs to give us a lovely review on iTunes. Yeah. Throw some stars our way, write a little thing that says, hey, I like them, and then you're golden. That's free. Yeah, it's been a little slow in the star category, guys. I don't know what to tell you. I think uh, I think we can all step up our game there. I can only do it over, under so many assumed names. Okay, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. The firmament can take all the stars that you can throw. So exactly. So get get your five stars going and uh, let's move on. Let's move on. Uncle Dan. Yes. Hello. You know, I once had a boss, and this is a real, who declared that leadership is knowing when to leave. <laughs> and uh, he always had a knack for leaving right before things got crazy, right. since, which I really admired. And I've tried to incorporate that into my own life. So uh, I, if you'll excuse me, I actually have to go right yeah. now. I've got a little <laughs> You're time. A smart man. So today we're going to talk a little bit about leaving or knowing when to leave. And ah. uh, to do so, we've invited a couple of friends. First of all, interlopers. Our, 
interlopers, uh, uh, aunties, if you will. Uh Uh, Our first uh, dear old friend is uh, Dr. Chrissy Stroop. Chrissy, how are you faring in sleepy Portland? Uh, You know, fine, I guess. Yeah. (laughs) Well, nothing going on there. Yeah, it's pretty pretty (laughs) quiet. And, uh, uh, it really is pretty quiet in most of the city. It's it's you know, but people they only show kind of right downtown where all the the hot action is. Essentially, right. it's wherever you are at any the given good, time. <laughs> the good blocks is what I like to call yeah. them. And uh, secondly, we want to welcome a new friend, Doctor Lauren O'Neill. <laughs> I uh, am a master, actually, not a doctor. Well, uh, good news. We bestowed upon you the How to Heretic <laughs> Honorary Doctorate of Letters. Yeah. Finally. And Finally. numbers and shapes. So, it is, uh, it is, which, it which is letters worth, does that include? Uh, yeah. s- any seven you like. Um, That's right. So go ahead and put that on your resume. It, I think it's, it's all be. the letters except P, H, and D. <laughs> <laughs> and you are in New York, I believe, uh, I Master am. Dr. Lauren. Yes. Uh, excellent. We're, How's we're, life there? We're a bi-coastal podcast right now. Tri-coastal, if you count the Great Salt Lake as one of the coasts. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and, and how is New York faring for you? Um, I haven't left my apartment in five months. <laughs> so just a normal day in New York. I'm paying Perfect. like a lot of rent to never leave my apartment. Good for you. Yeah. You're getting, you're getting your money's worth. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so we brought these two on. We we're a little late to the game, but today we want to talk about a book, uh, that the two of you have co-edited, contributed to, uh, to as well and published. Uh, tell us about Empty the Pews. Um, well, <laughs> it is a, it's an anthology of personal mm-hmm. essays uh, about leaving the church. We've got essays from former evangelicals, Catholics, Mormons, and uh, I am a former mainline Protestant, Presbyterian, to be specific. Mm. Um, nice. Sexy. <laughs> yeah, probably the least sexy title of any denomination, <laughs> Presbyterian. <laughs> yeah, Mormons um, were pretty boring, but then you start digging into it and it's like, oh, okay. They had, there's some <laughs> shit going on there. Yeah, Latter yeah. we've got some exciting Tell stuff happening. Yeah, we uh, we started talking about this project in I believe 2012 or so. We yeah, like tossed around the idea. One thousand years ago, <laughs> right. in uh, COVID time, in you before know, time, yeah, yeah. the <laughs> before time, yes, uh, the BC, if you will. Uh, so yeah, um, but we didn't start working on it really until 2016, and I think the um, election of Trump kind of made it all the more urgent. And so mm. we kind of framed the whole collection in, in terms of young people leaving conservative Christianity because of its bigotry, right-wing politics, culture wars, and, and so forth, and how right. we want to document that and preserve certain voices from uh, this this thing that's been happening really since the 1990s. There's been a huge a uh, surge in uh, people leaving religion and becoming unaffiliated. Mm-hmm. They are sometimes referred to as the nuns, N-O-N-E-S, which uh, includes people with a lot of different spiritual or even religious beliefs, but are no longer affiliated with any church, as well as atheists and agnostics. Right, right, right. right. Yes, the nuns, the nuns have been exploding, and I'm glad that you guys are compiling these stories for archaeologists to discover someday to know that we were here. <laughs> After know that we exist. the great age of stupid is over. So I, I want to read a few um, excerpts from the book, if that's OK with you guys. And then we sure. can just kind of talk about them, because there were some some that I found just so uh, just resonated with me so much. Um, the first one I want to read is uh, from A Girl's Guide to Sexual Purity by Carmen Maria Machado. Yes. Uh, and she describes, among other things, an awkward relationship with a much older pastor and her eventual escape from her faith. Um, And so at one point she says, I had made a forest of my own beliefs and lived in it. Here's how I left. I stripped away the trees. My first God was a mishmashed Frankenstein of my uh, imagination made up of scraps from the Methodist kids and the evangelical kids of, of my upbringing and my worst fears. Later when Sam abandoned me, that's the older pastor, I tried to believe in a God who loved and still left his creations. I could not. For a while, uh, God was a faint, hazy presence, and then even that evaporated. In time, the trees scrolled back. I'd made that forest up. Uh, perhaps, perhaps I'd needed to go through it to be the person I became, but to realize that it wasn't real, that took living. Uh, now I was still alone, but at least I could see in all directions. Mm. And then she, has re- she goes, kind of concludes this way. 
Uh, she's talking about her girlfriend <clears throat> that she hooked up. She's a lesbian, then. Uh-oh. Um, she's actually out. bi. Just F- Oh, well, fuck. <laughs> that ah! was my whole premise. Uh, so she's talking about being with her girlfriend. We watched marriage, uh, marriage equality blossom in one state and then another and then another. We read memoirs about the struggles of gay and lesbian activists in the 90s, our lifetimes, our childhoods, and realized how lucky uh, we are to have been born precisely when we were to have crawled out from beneath our past and found each other. True love doesn't wait for anything, as it turns out. And her, she concludes with a really nice bit. I found my purity ring not too long ago, tarnished and buried in a container of bric-a-brac. I'd kept it accidentally, carried it through five different moves to three different states. It was never more than a few feet away from where my joys, uh, away from my joys and heartbreaks. I took a picture of the etching on the band, a photographer's instinct to preserve even my most foolish choices, and went to throw the ring out. I paused over the trash can after a few seconds thought. I turned around and tossed it into my jewelry box, a reminder never to make promises I don't intend to keep. Nice. Very nice, huh? Very powerful oh, stuff. Yeah. The, the, the purity ring concept is, I mean, if there was ever an, a personal archaeology token as powerful as that, I can't think of what it would be. Mm. Yeah. I Luckily, I never had one of those. It's not, Mormons don't do it. Yeah, Mormons I've, have their um, own ring, but it's a totally different thing. <laughs> I've got a purity pledge. I think I still have it around somewhere. I've been wanting to find it because I'm super weird that way. Like, Oh, no. I would want that <laughs> totally. Ha- have you honored it, Chrissy? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, shit. That's a problem. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And that is a really nice story that uh, this is one of my favorites that Liz Lenz contributed yes. uh, called she, Cottonwood Creek. Okay, so Creek. wait, just tell me, just to pop in for one second. Mm. Pop. If if you liked that excerpt of Carmen Maria Machado's essay, um, you should buy her her latest book, which is called In the Dream House, um, and it has a lot of the same material that's in this essay. She recycled a lot of it into that book, um, and then if you if you like Liz Lenz's excerpt that you're about to hear she has a book out uh today as of this recording mm. um called belabored and you should also buy that hey Neat. chrissy can you come get your girl because i'm on here trying to hawk your book <laughs> <laughs> and she's selling everybody else's so you I know i don't know if you know how the publishing industry works lauren <laughs> <laughs> she knows better than i do okay so buy, also, buy those, i mean buy not, those not for nothing but it's not like we all have time to read in this in in, no. in this moment in history <laughs> so this is this is Liz's uh, uh, beautiful story, Cottonwood Creek. It's kind of a tale of her family's pursuit of some kind of Christian utopia <clears throat> and how she found herself inevitably falling into the same habit. And uh, this is her talking about a church she founded with her husband collapsing like all the, the previous dreams before it. Uh, is that what Eve did with the apple? That first bite, the wrecking, uh, the wrecking ball to an already ruined building? That first bite, the ruination of, tr- of the truth? I wonder why I did it. I had seen one utopia fail. Why did I try to create another? But then that is the model of the Christian God, creating a heaven, then an Eden. And when Eden failed, he opened up the rest of the world. This time it will be good, he said to himself, before erasing humanity with a flood and starting over. Hmm. And he will try again, or or so Christians believe. The promise of revelation is that God will set up a new heaven and a new earth. I can't wait to see how those fail too. Uh, that is Christianity waiting for both the end uh, and for paradise. Aren't we foolish to think that the two will ever be separated? We never leave the cycle. We cannot separate the failures of the creator from creation. We can never stop hoping that this time will be good. And there's a beautiful conclusion here. Uh, but that doesn't stop us from trying. Uh, five years after the church closed, I ended my 12-year marriage and moved out of the house I shared with my husband. I rented a small cottage where the yard is unkempt and wild like my daughter's hair. And despite knowing better, when I moved in, I thought, this time it will be good. And when that was (laughs) over, and when that that too is over, and as it will be, I will try to create another and another. Every good thing is dangerous speculation. Each place is a small fortress of hope. I thought that was really beautiful. I agree. It's it's very beautiful. this lens is really masterful in her prose. I also find it kind of depressing. I mean, I don't disagree. Utopia will never work and nothing human lasts forever. Um, I maybe disagree that we 
can't keep ourselves from trying. But I don't know. It's an interesting thought. It, it, I think it also to me, it also speaks to our programming, to the programming of people who come out of you know, high demand religions, that there is there's almost a gravity that's very hard to escape. Mm. You know, uh, uh, the way like when you read that whole story about this was just a program in her life. This is what her family did time after time after time. It's what she's done in her religious life. And now she's kind of it, to me, it's almost like making a, at some point the the lever has to make peace with their past or at least mm -hmm. learn to dance with those demons rather than, <laughs> than run from them. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Exactly. There's a lot of darkness in me. Yeah. And I think that's to me, that was kind of what her story was saying. She's like. All right. If these are the habits I have, I'm going to I'm going to own them and I'm going to make them work for me. That's so interesting. I hadn't thought about her essay from that angle, but that makes a lot of sense. Hmm. Oh, that's I, I'm learning to dance with my demons, I'm, but I'm not there yet. So I mean, totally. <laughs> that's like what making this book was for me. So, mm -hmm. well, let's let's talk about that. The next story I want to highlight is by one Lauren O'Neill. <gasps> what called I've a heard glutton, of her called a glutton and a drunkard. And I felt, it's I felt one of the seen. best essays in this book. And, uh, <laughs> and before I read a couple of excerpts, just why don't you tell us just a little bit about the story and, and about your, yourself? Oh, um, <laughs> I wasn't prepared. Um, <laughs> it's a subject you don't know anything about. <laughs> yeah, I know too much about it. Um, this, the, the essay is, uh, it starts with the line, uh, with my dad, it was God, God, God. And with my mom, it was fat, fat, fat. And it's uh, kind of about um, how Christianity and diet culture are actually somehow two sides of the same coin. Mm -hmm. And they're all about um, sort of uh, being disgusted with yourself and, and trying to rein yourself in. And mm -hmm. um, as a side effect of that, being disgusted with everyone else and trying to rein everyone else in as well. And it never works. True that. <clears throat> I totally buy that. And I think I, I've said this. Uh, I said this to Chrissy and Dan before. I think Lauren has the, the winning quote of the book, as far as I'm concerned, uh, which is beautiful, where uh, you say the Bible says to love your neighbor as as you love yourself. But what if Christianity has taught you not to love yourself? Then you hate your neighbor as you hate yourself, impotently in despair. I do think uh, that's one of the absolute best lines in the book. It's probably my favorite line in the entire book, too. Yeah. You all are so nice. <laughs> <laughs> we're not really. We're, we're not there. <laughs> going to say we're being so nice about that horrific quote. Yeah. I mean, it's, a it's a beautiful line, but, uh, but the concept so, is both true and deeply, deeply saddening. Well, there's so many yeah, moments. It's a powerful like, line, but it's yeah, There's not so a many moments one. like that in the book where you know, these nebulous ideas that we all have coming out of religion and, th you know, we were too close to it. We didn't understand it entirely. We didn't understand the emotional context of everything. And, and that's one of the moments in the book where I'm just like, oh my God, in such simple language, there is an entire notion, right? There is yeah. an entire arc of Christianity or religion summed up so succinctly. So I, there's, there's a lot of those, but that was my favorite. Um, and then just a little further, you say, I wouldn't say I've ever had an eating disorder, uh, but surely there's something disordered about feeling a constant current of guilt for consuming more than a few hundred calories per day. I wouldn't say being raised Christian was, necessar uh, was necessarily abusive either, but surely there's something wrong with being taught uh, to feel a constant current of guilt for being an inherently sinful human. Surely the mere fact of existing shouldn't fill me with dread and despair, even as an adult who left both the church and dieting culture behind many years ago. Uh, it may not have been abuse, but it was sort of spiritual starvation and eating disorder of the soul. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I, that connection makes so much sense to me. And I was, not, you know, no one ever told me to diet at all because I'm a boy or whatever. But like yeah. the, the connection just clicks for me. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's especially strong for women, but I don't think men are exempt from it. Um, there, from there are that different... like idea of of diet culture in some ways, but also just like the idea that your body is sinful. It probably manifests a little differently um, in the way it's taught to Christian boys. But like the idea that the body is is bad. Yeah, oh, totally. You know, 
Well, it def it, to me, it also definitely speaks to how genders the genders experience their their Christianity differently, their their time in Christianity mm. differently. You know. Yeah, I mean, I wasn't really being taught since I was socialized and raised as a boy to uh, to diet, but I actually did go on the slim fast diet in middle school because I thought I was too fat. Interesting. I mean, because my household was was so focused on this, my little brother definitely um, has has told me how he felt like he needed to go on a diet. Um, and it wasn't like directed at him. I don't think anyone ever told him that he should go on a diet. But hmm. because he was immersed in like me and my sister and my mom, that's what he picked up on. He was picking up what they were of, putting down. Exactly. There, there are plenty of ways that Christianity can make you hate yourself, you know, <laughs> in, in, internalize in a certain way. I mean, uh, conservative Christianity, there's a long line from antiquity to the present, has all kinds of hangups about all kinds of human things that have to do with the body that definitely aren't, you know, exclusively for women, even though right. particularly when it comes to purity culture, it hits them harder. Right. Totally. I, and, you know, I, I, as a young closeted queer kid in uh, Mormonism, I definitely saw those as a bit of an outsider, whereas my peers were kind of seeing, um, you know, the demands for certain masculine versus feminine behaviors is just to them normal. Right. So, yeah, I totally get it. So <clears throat> um, there's this great I want to I want to give our Mormon friends a shout out here. So this is a story called <laughs> Burden of Proof by Mel Wells. Uh, who is a former Mormon and a survivor of some terrible abuse who describes surviving not only physical and emotional torment, uh, but the struggle of a gay woman trying to be something she was not. Mm. Tons of us won't understand that. Um, <laughs> she says, a beautiful excerpt here. My faith died in the spring of 2007. I was driving uh, from BYU housing to my BYU job and spotted a billboard for postmormon.org. Once I had the courage to go to the website, I pulled an all-nighter. This is such a common story. I pulled an all-nighter all researching the true, not sanctioned history, not church-sanctioned history of my religion. My Mormon worldview shattered mm -hmm. overnight as I discovered that it was based on easily disproved doctrines. By morning, I was awash in shock and anger, and I hesitate to admit this, relief. God's judgment no longer lo loomed over me, and his love was no longer out of reach. None of it existed. Uh, God, my heavenly father, was dead. Uh, they were putting my stepdad in the ground as I wrote the first draft of this essay. And I found myself thinking, that's all? It's over? I confess it's perplexing that the larger, larger than life monstrous power he had over my childhood is, in hindsight, so small. Uh, maybe that is where the shame stems from. I feel embarrassed to have been so influenced. You were mm. a child, my wife reminds me. It's not your fault. There's a scene in the movie Good Will Hunting where Robin Williams' character tells Matt Damon's character that the abuse he'd been subjected to was not his fault. Williams repeats that a few times as we watch Damon go through cold indifference, hot anger, and finally tears. I choke up every time. Abused people nearly always feel responsible for their abuser's actions. It helps us push away the freelancing, uh, the freelancing, the free falling terror of never knowing what might spark an attack. We seek causation because it feels like control. And as a, as an abuse survivor, Mormon slash abuse survivor myself, that really resonated with me quite a bit. Um, because I think part of what these structures do is enable abuse of so many different kinds, right? Mm -hmm. And physical just being one of them. <clears throat> well, it's it, not it just really it, it's not just an enabling. Let's be clear. Uh, I've read a lot of the Bible, not the whole thing. <laughs> uh, it it's instructive about abuse like it tells you how and when and why to abuse it's so this isn't just a, a side effect or or you know it's not like this is just a tent that religion is just a tent under which abusers may hide yeah it is rather a and it it's it's sanctioned by yeah. most religion i mean certainly Bible... certainly conservative christians take those passages to heart spare the rod and spoil the child and that sort of thing yeah and the bible actually describes god as a a spouse who um it's you know there's a there's a verse about like egypt will uh cringe away like a spouse getting like a wife getting beaten by her husband that's you know, like, wow it's god the, poet, will, it's the poetry beat, i love yeah. god um, will beat egypt like a husband beats his wife you know um, there's also conflation of love and discipline yeah yeah and and these and these structures almost like Dan ninety nine percent of the time end up being completely patriarchal. 
right? So it is, right. it is man being handed the keys to to the family, right? It's the man Which, dominant. As a, as a straight, cis, white man, it feels like I made a mistake leaving at this point. <laughs> <laughs> You're the only one it could have worked out for, Dan. Yeah. Of all, of all four of us, so... Uh, and I want to I want to touch on this story, um, which is from an obscure personage called now defunct confessions of a former for- uh, short term youth missionary to Russia mm. by our dear friend Chrissy Stroop. <laughs> so, Chrissy, I, I want to read the opening if I can. <clears throat> Feel which free. I, I just love. There's a certain odor of Russia, a mix of tar and particular kinds of exhausts and, and who knows what else. It isn't offensive, really. It's just present. And it's still there. Despite all the changes that have taken place over the years, every time I get a whiff of something akin to this, to that distinctive post-Soviet aroma here in the United States, I'm briefly whisked back to Russia in my mind, sometimes to the very first time I visited that, the country that would become a much bigger part of my life than I ever imagined possible. So I love that because I kind of share that with you. I was there a few years before you. I was a very young man. Mm-hmm. And I, that when you describe that smell, I could, inst- I could taste it, you know, <laughs> it's was... really, it's really something. And it smells are so hard to describe, but yeah. Um, yeah, if you've smelled it, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. And it's distinctive. I've never, I've never felt that anywhere else. It's gotta um, be particular, per- particular particulates, but well, I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when, when you say Russia has an influence, are you talking about, uh, like in our political process or is that <laughs> in your life it's choosing your 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 presidents is that <laughs> what you're referencing uh no no oh, okay. i've spent a lot of time in russia you know because after being uh inspired to learn russian um and you know having these these pen pals and you know even having then a relationship with one of the people that i met at um this, these Russian summer camps, well, they weren't Russian summer camps. They, they were Russian summer camp sites where our American evangelical organization led mission trips, right? So they were sort of, you know, Russian American summer camps for Jesus. Um, but yeah, I mean, I had friends, I had pen pals. And so I ended up deciding to um, study Russian history when I decided to study history and, and go on to do that for a PhD. So I taught English in Russia for a year. Um, after I finished college. And by that time, I had deconstructed my faith enough that I did not want to be involved with any kind of missionary projects. And so I just went to a regular secular school, except then I learned that, you know, those kinds of things may have some sort of cultural missionary elements to them as well, though I certainly mm. don't, don't want to bash this particular project. I mean, I think it, um, it's been a good uh, site of cultural exchange in the town of Vladimir. It's um, a place called the American Home. Mm-hmm. Um, it still exists, but, you know, in the recent climate of declining Russian American relations, the land it was on and the building, uh, was expropriated by the city government and they turned it into a museum of Russian cherry production. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can't wait to visit. That's really cherries. Yes. top of mind yeah. for me. How did the yeah. Russians produce cherries that's literally top of mind so they already I, made a whole play about that we don't need that's, to. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> well and that's i like that's how you end your essay chrissy is you're just t- saying look you know i i wasn't in in many ways i'm not the person i was when that experience began but you you don't regret that that's the direction your life took right that that you became this russia scholar and you're fluent in russian and you have this this connection to this other country in so many great ways and i like how you kind of bring the story home with that uh thanks yeah i mean i don't regret having learned all those things and if some of the experiences were harrowing to live through like you know um being uh in russia from 2012 to 2015 and living there through the annexation of crimea and um you know the subsequent um, capital flight, devaluation of the ruble. My salary was paid in rubles. I was trying to pay down debt in dollars. It was pretty stress. <laughs> it was pretty stressful. But I had a front row seat uh, do some interesting historical events. I'm kind of glad to be on this side of them. And you know, and I'm sad about the direction that Russia has gone, just as I'm sad about the direction that America has gone and continues to go. But one insight that I came away with is that Russia and America are very similar places. Mm. We're both totally fucked up. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. In our own special way. (laughs) 
So I, I want to jump into, well, actually, I wanted to read some excerpts from Linda Tirado's story. But I honestly think reading up excerpts is doing it a disservice. I think people need to read it in full because it is too crazy to be true. Um, Linda's story is wild. It is wild. And it's amazing. And she's, as we know from recent news events, a hard ass. So please get the book and read her story. Yes, yeah. you may have seen her uh, on Twitter. It was it was widely circulated. She lost an eye to a rubber bullet in yeah. the recent protests. Yeah, covering them as a, as a journalist. So Yeah, she went up to Minneapolis and, yeah. Again, Russia and America. We're not so different, are we, Chrissy? Right? Well, no, no, no. We are in so many ways, like reflections of each other we have we both have these like post-imperial hangovers and ah. we we have this really stupid need to feel great and we have like i don't mean like feel great like oh it feels so great being in the bathtub right now but like you know great right the whole bullshit yeah. concept of greatness we have to be the greatest country in the world yeah so of course we make great frenemies yeah we're perfect for yeah, perfect mirror images of each other. And the well, funny and thing is, you know, when I first started going to to Russia and even getting interested in foreign travel, I was looking for things that were different so I could hold them up as a mirror to America and criticize America. And then, you know, a couple decades later, I'm like, yeah. So both the countries I chose to like so, you know, spend a lot of my life in suck in very similar ways. <laughs> They're both full of conspiracy theorists. You yeah, you, you decided <laughs> not to go to to uh, Denmark or Norway. So that's on you. So well, well, one, of the, one, of the things, <laughs> one of the parallels that I think is really interesting about the U.S. and Russia is, especially in this moment in history, is the deep connection between religion and the state. And yes. Even though America has pretense toward that not being the case, right now, I mean, there are innumerable pastors with a hall pass to the White House. And, you know, that, that one compares that to, uh, to the Russian Orthodox Church, which is basically a state-sanctioned uh, religion. Oh, absolutely. Just look at all the um, taxpayer money that illegitimately went to mega churches and oh yeah, Christian we just did a story on the, things on like the, that through that on the whole, war church, you know, yeah, uh, so-called small business loan program. Yeah, it's crazy. So, so let's leave Russia for a minute and uh, let's finish before we just go crazy uh, with a couple of pieces of this essay by the the artist, writer, and musician Isaac Marion called A Better Dream. And I, this one really spoke to me, maybe as a fellow kind of creative and artist, I responded to his language, but I, I, I really think this is a great essay to end the book with. And uh, I'll, I'll read a couple short pieces so you guys can see why I think that. By the time I was a teenager, I was deeply dissatisfied with the worldview the church was feeding me. And it wasn't just the sketchy theology or regressive social mores. It was the shadow of nihilism behind it all. Because for all the talk about hope and joy, Christianity is a doomsday faith. We, we kept our eyes on the sky, craving Christ's return and the earthly annihilation it would bring. Life was merely an obstacle on our path to heaven. Um, God, would, God put it there, so it must have had a purpose. But we were a bit hazy on what the purpose might be. Because the final tally of the universe uh, had no space for human contributions. Earth was a temporary stage for a brief and confusing drama. And when it reached its scripted conclusion, God would step in to sweep the stage clean along with anything we'd managed to build on it. I found this idea incredibly bleak. I could see no reason for us to be here, no reason to look forward to the future, to take care of the planet uh, or co uh, contribute to society or work toward a better world because there would be no better world. It, it was all right here in uh, all right there in Revelation. The world would get worse and worse until God finally pulled the plug on this strange experiment, nuked it from orbit in an apocalyptic fire and whisked us away to heaven. Nothing we could do would affect the conclusion or efforts. We would leave no trace. Our effort, we would leave no trace. Um, and then Sounds he finishes. Sounds good to me. Yeah, great. Right? <laughs> and then he finishes. I struggled with very similar thoughts, you know. Yeah, I think we all did. Like, if and it's all going the idea to be that destroyed, heaven, what's the purpose? That heaven was going to be boring. And when I thought that as a kid, I was so afraid that I would go to hell for thinking it. But like, I couldn't imagine eternity let alone eternity of singing praises to God forever, it really sounded quite dull and unattractive. So that's part of our whole podcast is for a certain a certain patronage level. We will, we will write a heaven for you. And they're all based on that principle. That it's like amazing, 
but after like the first 12 million years, it's the same <laughs> shit, right? Well, well, yeah. never I don't, I don't even know think how many s- of you might have watched Lu- been watching Lucifer. I'm I'm eagerly waiting for season five. But, you know, one of my favorite lines from from that show is when Lucifer, in spite of himself, kind of gets to know and gets to like a, uh, a Catholic priest who then dies. And then he's upset that he's dying. And he says, it's really boring where you're going. <laughs> <laughs> he should take I, it to hell. I was going to ask if you had seen The Good Place, where after a few uh, Jeremy Baramies, <laughs> you get bored. Yeah. I haven't seen it's it yet. It's not referenced but I, in Lynn. That's okay. <laughs> highly recommended. I haven't seen it yet. So... I'll finish his essay off here. I'll finish with this little excerpt. Uh, Surely I'm angry at God for the death of a loved one or for the suffering of children or some other dramatic betrayal. Well, not really. Christianity, Christianity wasn't a soap opera to me. It was, a re, it was real and I took it seriously. Events in my personal life don't change the structure of the universe. I don't turn my back on the law of gravity because a friend dies in a plane crash. If it's true, it's true, right? But religion isn't gravity. Religion isn't true or untrue, and that's not the point. Religion will never be provable. So all we can ask for is for it to be meaningful, for it to resonate with our lived experience. Gravity is meaningful. Gravity explains things that I observe in the world around me. It illuminates cause and effect and fits into my experiences in ways that intuitively work. Christian theology, at least the version of it that permeates our culture, doesn't work. It doesn't grow organically from the human experience. It's a strange alien universe superimposed over our own, an awkward assemblage of uh, arbitrary rules and paradoxical concepts shoved roughly over the world we know. I think that's pretty pretty sweet. That's pretty beautiful. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I can't disagree. Yeah. I think it's a really concise uh, concise idea of like, it it just needs to work, right? And at some point in your life, you're like, I don't think this is working. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, there's this whole the, the whole concept of the God of the gaps, which is that, you know, religion's there to explain all the things that we don't have answers for. And as those gaps get in, increasingly in, infinitesimal, as we start to understand the universe more and more, it start the, the question then becomes like, what, what are we doing with this God guy? Is he is he useful anymore? <laughs> Yeah, he's just in the gaps. He's not in the wide open spaces at this point. Right. So. <laughs> he, um, and, he, and he's certainly not. He explains less and less, and the, the explanations are less and less satisfying as we sort of understand yeah, our mean, universe. You know, to me, I think a useful God concept wouldn't be one that so much explains everything as you know, helps us to navigate life in, in ways that, you know, to use Isaac Marion's word, are meaningful. But mm-hmm. the, the kind of God that I learned about in the kind of Christianity that I internalized and was just, you know, swimming and growing up doesn't do that. He makes everything worse. He's a giant abuser. He's a, he's a right. giant, you know, nagging pickup artist in the sky. Right. Um, hmm. Yeah. I also think about like, oh, we still, you like, you still get high profile Christians being like, oh, well we had this earthquake uh, because of gay marriage, <laughs> you know? And it's like, Okay, you know, 3,000 years ago, when you didn't understand what an earthquake was or a flood or, you know, lightning. Yeah. Yeah, the best explanation was it must be God. We have better explanations. <laughs> but now that we yeah. have better explanations, like, do we still need to keep turning to God for, for earthquakes? Well, if he confirms all your biases, yes. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's... Exactly. That kind of thing exactly. is part of what I call a politics of providentialism. Uh, that's an excellent term for it. Um, so to conclude, you guys have a little news, I think. We do. Yes. Are we breaking it on the How to Heretic? Just yeah, uh, this, this is exclusive. You got exclusive from it. <laughs> okay, it's an exclusive. <laughs> Woo! I'm excited. <laughs> tell us, tell us, what is our exclusive news? Well, we've been talking to Epiphany Publishers, uh, which published Empty the Pews, uh, for some time now about doing a uh, follow-up volume. And we're ready to announce that we're going to be doing that. We, we don't have a working title for it yet, but we do have a concept of how we want to develop the, the direction from the first book and expand on it or just kind of, you know, make things a little bit different. But same, same broad idea. Lauren, do you want to get more specific? Um, no, you do it. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so, you know, did you guys not fight on our fucking show? Could you like work this shit out before you come on? You know what? Fine. I'll uh, do it. I'll do it. Then do it. <laughs> so the, I just don't want to monopolize the, my time. But OK, so um, 
Empty the Pews has essays only by uh, former conservative Christians from uh, Catholic, Mormon, and evangelical traditions, and Lauren is the one mainliner. Um, so, <laughs> but it also has a kind of geographic scope where we focus on North American Christianity, though we sometimes look at its international uh, footprint impact, also diasporas and immigration and so and those sorts of things. So we're going to keep that geographic focus the same for this next volume. Hmm. But we want to start uh, broadening what kinds of former believers we talk to, uh, to in order to facilitate wider ex-fundamentalist conversations. So nice. this this second volume is going to include, for example, ex Amish, uh, probably ex Jehovah's Witnesses. Maybe um, I, I think we'll want to have more uh, ex Mormons. We didn't have many in the last one, but also maybe fundamentalist Mormons, ex Muslims, mm. ex ultra Orthodox Jews, um, and, and so forth. And maybe instead of situating this so much in a framing of you know electoral politics. This one will look more at uh, social issues and psychological problems on the ground, um, help, help us perhaps get, a, get a, a handle on some things that are similar and different for people who come out of fundamentalism uh, of, of different sorts. You know, And I know that one major issue that many ex-fundamentalists have, whether they're ex-ultra-Orthodox Jewish, uh, ex-Amish, um, sometimes ex-evangelical or ex-fundamentalist, um, you know, when you've gone to Christian schools or you've been homeschooled, is that, you know, you get a really terrible education. You get this ideological indoctrination instead. And sometimes right. you don't even get basic life skills like math, et cetera. Right. Um, there is no federal right to a robust education for well, not, children. Especially not in, right now. <laughs> in the United States. Yeah. I mean, there's not even a legally recognized right. And in fact, there is Supreme Court precedent. 1972, I believe, Wisconsin v. Yoder mm -hmm. is the uh, SCOTUS decision that allowed the Amish communities to uh, only educate uh, their children up through eighth grade right. and only in their own kind of very specific schools, uh, which, of course, makes it difficult for young people to actually make a conscious choice of how they want to navigate their Amish heritage and whether they want to leave the church or not. Right. Right. I mean, everyone makes a big deal out of the whole like room Springer thing, which um you know, supposedly gives them the choice to uh, yeah, rebel it's a, it's, and leave. It's, or it's say, a, but it's, it's a, it's a trap. Yeah, right. Yeah, we've all been given, we've yeah. all been given supposed choices, right? Yes, like, exactly. Right. Yeah, it, 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 it's set up for them to fail and come back to the safety of the church and the Amish yeah. community, right? So, um, so yeah, uh, I've been involved with um, this organization called the Amish Heritage Foundation mm -hmm. uh, that was founded by Tora Bontrager who escaped an abusive situation and, um, you know, ran away from home after eighth grade to live with an uncle who had also left an Amish community so that she could continue to educate herself. Mm. And so the, ch the children's rights and um, children's right in particular to an education is something that she cares deeply about. Uh, so that's kind of what's been shaping my thinking as I want to move toward this new project with Lauren. And yeah, looking at, um, looking at like more at the margins um you know there's a lot of evangelicals a lot of catholics a lot of mormons but then if you start looking at jehovah's witnesses and amish and mm -hmm. and like even like i mean there's just simply not that many like muslims in america there's not right. that many ultra orthodox <laughs> jews in america um yeah, we're we're looking more at the margins on nice. the, in the sequel. Well, I look forward to uh, reading the second one as well. I mean, I don't look forward to it, but it's kind of my job. <laughs> <laughs> I, I cannot um, recommend thanks. this book enough. Um, I I really hope everybody will have the opportunity to read it. It's beautiful, and it spoke to me obviously a hundred different ways. Um, you guys, where can people find you if they want to go looking for you? Well, first, let me say really fast uh, for those who might be interested in uh, submitting a proposal for mm. an essay contribution to the second volume, which doesn't have a title yet, uh, send us an email at empty the pews two, that's spelled out empty the pews and then just the number two at gmail.com. Um, and we'll have a call for proposals up soon, letting people know the criteria, like you know, how many words do we expect and so forth. Um, but yeah, and as for where you can find me, um, I'm on Twitter at C underscore Stroop, S-T-R-O-O-P. I also have a website at csroop.com. I write regularly right now for Religion Dispatches and The Conversationalist. Um, I've contributed less regularly to Dame Magazine, 
Playboy magazine, Foreign Policy magazine. So yeah, I'm she's around. everywhere. She's literally everywhere. <laughs> you know, Dame and Playboy. Yeah, just yeah. Like, you know, <laughs> sister, sister publications. And religion basically. dispatches. It's all the same, really. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, I am on Twitter at Lauren E. O'Neill. O'Neill spelled with an A like Shaquille spells it. Um, and my podcast is Sunday School Dropouts. Um, it's on hiatus at the moment. But if you want to listen to uh, me, an ex-Christian, and my husband, a non-believing sort of Jew, read all the way through the Bible, <laughs> you can listen to that. Amazing. Excellent. Excellent. Well, thank Sounds you both great. so much for joining us. Uh, and thank you for your work. And uh, we will talk to you guys again soon. Well, pro- so we'll talk to you us. when the next book comes out. Yeah. <laughs> well, not before. We, uh, yeah, I hope it'll be before that. Because <laughs> yes. I don't know, this could take a while. All right. Take care. <laughs> you too. Well, friends, that's it for this week's Barn Burner of a Show. Hey, we'd love to hear from you. Send us an email at howto at howtoheretic.com. Or if you are Ishtar, and why wouldn't you be, why don't you leave me a voicemail about it, 903-88-HOW-TO, which is 903-884-6986. I'm also on Twitter at howtoheretic. Oh, God, that's me. And thanks to our awesome patrons. <laughs> we're just, man, what a week we're having. And thanks to Cody Layton, especially this week, for editing the show. It's only going to take him a month. And thanks to all of you, dear friends, for tuning in. Bye, friends. Bye-bye.